affect the social solidarity of my community. The free software movement is concerned with these deeper questions. A program is free software if it respects the user's freedom and the user's community. Software which is not free is called non-free software or proprietary software or user-subjugating software because it keeps users divided and helpless. Divided because they are forbidden to share it with anyone else. And helpless because they don't have the source code so they can't change it. They can't even verify what it really does to them. And it may often do nasty things. So, <clears throat> free software is a matter of freedom. It's free as in freedom, not free as in price. So think of free speech, not free beer. <laughs> Even Bush says he's in favor of freedom, and Bush can't recognize freedom even after he steps on it. So we need to say something more specific. Actually, that light is a bit too bright for me. It's, it's actually starting to intermit. Okay, that's better. Thanks. <clears throat> So we have to say something more specific. A program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make exact copies and distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified virtual system, one that attacks the user's freedom or community or both, and thus we call it proprietary software, and that software is an injustice, so it should not exist. <clears throat> to develop a free program is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution? That depends on the details. But at least it's being made available to society in a way that does not attack society. But a proprietary program is not a contribution to society. It's a power grab. So it's simply wrong. Regardless of what the program does, to release it that way is wrong. So this is not a technical question. This is not a question about how to write software or how what, or what software can or should do. It's about the freedom that users deserve when they are running a program. <clears throat> a non-free program effectively is a trap that lures users into giving up their freedom in order to use the program. So if the program has any convenient features, those are the bait for the trap. But when you have learned to recognize and value your freedom, you will resist the bait, and you won't fall into the trap. So these are, this is the, these four freedoms define free software, but why define free software this way? What makes these freedoms essential? Each one has its reason. Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to distribute exact copies when you wish, is essential on basic moral grounds so you can lead an upright life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom two, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment. Whenever your friend says, that program is nice, could I have a copy? At that moment, you would face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Being in the dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license. But what makes that the lesser evil? 
We can suppose that your friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. This is not the only possible case, but it is a real possible case. By contrast, the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. Now, if you can't help doing wrong to somebody, it's better to do it to somebody who deserves it. And the developer deserves it. So, if you are in, in this dilemma, and you can't avoid doing wrong to your friend or the developer, do it to the developer. But, being the lesser evil doesn't make, mean it's right doesn't mean it's good. So, <clears throat> it's never a good thing to make an agreement and break it. Now, this is an example of an agreement that is evil. So, keeping it is worse than breaking it, but breaking it still is not good. And if you give your friend a copy, <clears throat> what will he have? He will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program something pretty bad, almost as bad as an authorized copy. So, once you have fully understood this issue, what should you really do? You should make sure you don't fall into the dilemma. I know of two ways to avoid it. One is, don't have any friends. That's the method implicitly suggested by the proprietary software developers. The other method is reject proprietary software. That's my method. If someone offers me a program on the condition I promise not to share it with you, I say my conscience does not allow me to accept that condition, so take your nasty program away. And that's what you should do also. You should reject proprietary software. You should refuse to betray the rest of your community. And you should also reject the propaganda terms they use to demonize cooperation. <coughs> terms like pirate. When they use, when they apply the word pirate to people who share with their neighbors, what are they really saying? They are saying that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. Morally speaking, nothing could be more wrong than that, because attacking ships is very bad, but helping your neighbor is good. So, if you don't agree with their bizarre, crazy morality, don't endorse it by using their propaganda terms. Don't call sharing piracy. When someone asks me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. And when someone asks me what I think of software piracy or music piracy, I say, as far as I know, pirates don't use computers or play musical instruments to attack ships. They use guns. Well, you could imagine a pirate who terrorizes the crew by playing such bad music. But I don't think it would really work. <clears throat> so that's the reason for freedom too. The freedom to help your neighbor. The freedom to make and distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program, is essential so you can control your computing. There are proprietary programs that even restrict how the user, or where, or when, or why the user can run the authorized copies. And that is obviously not controlling your computing. So freedom zero is essential. The freedom to run the program as you wish. But it's not enough, because that just means you can either do or not do whatever the code is set up to let you do. So the developer still imposes his decisions on you, not through the license, but instead through the code. Well, it's equally unacceptable. So you need freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do what you wish. This way you decide instead of letting the developer impose decisions on you. 
If you use a program without Freedom One, you can't even tell what it's doing. And many of them have malicious features. For instance, they spy on the user. One proprietary program that spies on the user that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. When the user of Windows invokes the menu feature to search her own files for a word, Windows sends a message saying what the word was. Well, that's one spy feature. And when Windows XP asks for an upgrade over the net, it sends Microsoft the list of all the programs installed on the machine. Another spy feature, but Microsoft never announced these spy features. They were discovered by other people investigating. So, it's quite possible that there are other spy features in Windows that people haven't found yet. But spying on a user is not limited to Windows. Windows Media Player also spies on the user. In fact, it does total surveillance. It reports everything the user looks at. But please don't think that Microsoft did this because Microsoft is uniquely evil and nobody else would be so bad. In fact, Real Player spies on the user the same way. And it looks like Real Player probably did it first. We don't have conclusive proof, but it looks that way. After all, Microsoft is better known for imitation than for invention. And lots of companies make spyware, but it gets worse. There is also the malicious feature, the functionality of refusing to function. That is, features designed to restrict the user. Where the program says, I don't want to let you see the contents of this file, even though it's in your computer. I don't want to let you copy part of this file, even though it's in your computer. I don't want to print this file for you, because I don't like you. <laughs> well, the program really has no volition. So it's really the developer of the program that doesn't like you and designed this program to restrict you. These features are known as Digital Restrictions Management, or DRM. <clears throat> and they are designed to attack your freedom. They attack your freedom at two levels at once, because the purpose of these features is to restrict people's use of their copies of published works. <clears throat> but the method used attacks your freedom also because they publish these works encrypted in a secret format and the idea is then that the only way to access them at all is with a proprietary program. Because these works are designed to attack your freedom, you should never accept them. Never buy or rent or <clears throat> even accept as a gift an encrypted DVD that unless you personally have the free program capable of playing the DVD. <clears throat> but because large groups of companies work together to impose these malicious features. We need an organized response. The Free Software Foundation has set up a site called Defective by Design, which is defectivebydesign.org, which is a campaign of protests against digital restrictions management. <clears throat> Go to the site, sign up, and you'll receive announcements of our protest actions. Some of them we do physically, and there must be enough people in Bangalore that you can set up protests here. And some are done virtually, and you can do them from anywhere. Please join. We need to show multinational companies that if they try to attack our freedom with DRM, they will be hated. We need to teach them a lesson that they don't mess with our freedom. But it gets worse than that. There are also the malicious features designed to attack the user, backdoors. 
One proprietary program that has a back door that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. You see, with Windows XP, Microsoft started determining the user's identity. So when Windows XP asks for an upgrade over the net, Microsoft can deliver to that user an upgrade designed specifically for him. What does that mean? It means Microsoft can change the software on his machine however it wishes to. And the user has no recourse. <clears throat> this is the back door we can deduce from known facts. But there may be more. A few years ago, India arrested some of the developers of Windows and accused them of working simultaneously for Microsoft and for Al-Qaeda, installing another backdoor that Microsoft wouldn't know about. That attempt apparently failed. Was there another that succeeded? We can't check. But we know that Microsoft installed a backdoor for another terrorist organization, even more violent than Al-Qaeda, namely the United States government. <laughs> That was caught in 1999 in a piece of server software. Whether they have put a similar backdoor into Windows, we don't know. Well, this should be enough to show you that you can never rationally trust a program without Freedom 1. We know that Windows spies on the user, it has features designed to restrict the user, and it has a backdoor. There is never, you know, so, and any non-free program without Freedom 1 could have some more malicious features. You can never check. So, all these programs demand blind faith. It's the only possible basis for using them. It's impossible ever to have a basis for rational trust. It's blind faith or nothing. And what it should be is nothing. You shouldn't use them. Now, with Windows XP, maybe if the user turns off upgrades completely, maybe Microsoft can't forcibly install a malicious upgrade. We know that if the upgrade facility is turned on, Microsoft can use it to forcibly install changes without even asking the user. But if it's turned off, maybe Microsoft can't do that. So of course in Windows Vista, they solved that problem. With Windows Vista, Microsoft can forcibly install changes at any time, and the user has no way of preventing that. But please don't think Microsoft is uniquely evil, and that only Microsoft would do this, because Apple did the same thing. With Mac OS X, Apple can forcibly install changes without asking the user. So, it's an understatement to say that Microsoft and Apple can take control of the user's computer when they wish, because they always have that control. And this shows us the logical end point of proprietary software. Proprietary software is a system of unjust power of the developer over the users. Now, when somebody has power, he's tempted to try to use it to get more power. And that's what these malicious features do, ending up with total power where they can change the software forcibly at any time. And it's not just them. Many cell phones do the same thing. It's a common goal for the companies to aim for, total power. But to prevent that, this thing is, the thing to do is don't let them have unjust power in the first place. I'm not claiming that every non-free program without Freedom 1 has malicious features. Some developers put them in and some don't, I suppose. The point is, we can't check. So in some of the programs, we know of malicious features. In other programs, we just don't know. So maybe they have malicious features and maybe they don't, but we can't tell. 
There may be lots of proprietary programs with no malicious features, but we can't identify any of them. But we can make a statement about them all, and that is their developers are human, so they make mistakes. The code of those programs has bugs. And the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless against an accidental bug as against a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you are a prisoner of the software you use. We, the developers of free software, are human too. We also make... And a lot of us use it, but we want some improvements. Well, somebody can start with this version, make some of that change, and release his modified version. And someone else can start with that and make some more of a change and release her modified version. And someone else can start with that and make more change and release her modified version. And then we'll have the improvements we wanted and we'll say, okay, those three developers collaborated to make this improvement. Thank you. And thus, Freedom 3 is essential. But even those who don't know how to program can take advantage of it indirectly. Suppose you are using a program and you wish it were different. And suppose you're using it in your business and you're making money, therefore, from doing work that involves using this program. But the program is not quite right. Suppose your business would work better if you change it. It would be worth it to you to pay somebody to change it for you. So you could find a programmer who's willing to do the work. You can choose the one that you think will do it best because it's a free market. Support for free software is a free market. So then you give a copy of your version to that programmer. In this you exercise your freedom too. Then he changes the program as you asked exercising his freedom one. Then he gives you a copy of his version, his modified version, exercising his freedom three. And then if it works, you pay him. So you have taken advantage of three of the four freedoms to get the changes you want. And if, meanwhile, if you as an individual would like a change in a program and you're not a programmer, maybe you have a cousin who's a programmer. Maybe you can convince her to change the program for you. And maybe you'll do another favor for her another time. <clears throat> so we all get to benefit from the four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedom zero and freedom two. The freedom to run the program as you wish, and the freedom to distribute exact copies when you wish, because these don't require programming. Any user is capable of doing these. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally to distribute copies of your modified versions, they require programming. So any given user is capable of exercising these more or less depending on how much he knows how to program. And some people don't learn any programming so they can't exercise these freedoms. But they still get the benefit of living in a society where people have these freedoms. Because when other people who are programmers change the software and when they choose to release their modified versions, then all of us can install those versions or not as we wish. So we all get the benefits of freedom, and the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Everybody can contribute to, the, to society's decision about what to do with this program in the future, because that decision is simply the sum total of all the individual decisions we make about what to do with the program. So, with free software, we have individual freedom, 
social solidarity, and democracy. With proprietary software, we have dictatorship because a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its developer, and it functions as an instrument to impose that developer's power on the users. So we have dictatorship, unjust power, and exploitation. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. <clears throat> I reached the conclusion that software should be free in the early 80s, and I wanted to be able to use a computer and have freedom. But that was impossible, because the computer won't run without an operating system. It's useless. And all the operating systems back then were proprietary. Previously, there had been free operating systems. In 1970, it was not unusual for an operating system to be free software. In the lab at MIT, where I worked throughout the 70s, we used a free operating system. But by 1980, that had become very unusual. And then that computer became obsolete, and my community died, and all the operating systems were proprietary. So I realized I could do something to change this. I was an operating system developer. I had been working on developing this free operating system before. Well, all I had to do was write another operating system, and then I, being the author, could legally make it free. And then everybody would be able to use computers and have freedom with that system. So I decided to... I decided that I would develop a free software operating system or die trying of old age, of course, because back then the free software movement that I was launching had no active enemies. Lots of people thought it was silly, but they didn't bother to pay attention. They didn't bother to oppose us. So the obstacle was just, it's a very big job. To have a, an operating system, you need hundreds of programs nowadays, thousands, but back then it was hundreds. And I didn't know if I'd ever succeed, but I had to try. So I decided to develop this operating system. I decided to recruit others to help so we'd get it finished sooner. And I decided to follow the design of Unix to make it portable, because I knew it would take many years to finish this job. And during that time, computers would probably change. I wanted to make a system that would still be able to run in the computers of 10 or 20 years in the future. So I, just, I decided to use this design which worked and was portable. And then I decided to make the system compatible with Unix so that the many users of Unix would find it easy to switch. And then I gave it the name GNU, which is a joke because part of, you see, because basically I'm a hacker. And what does a hacker mean? A hacker is a person who enjoys playful cleverness and regularly looks for opportunities to practice playful cleverness. And this doesn't have to be with computers. You can be playfully clever in all sorts of areas of life. <clears throat> and hackers have an expression H-H-O-S, which stands for Ha Ha Only Serious. Because no matter how serious something is, you still might as well make jokes in it. So this is the most important... I knew when I started this that this would probably be, if successful, the most important thing I would do in my life. Nothing could be more serious than fighting for freedom, but that doesn't mean you can't have a joke. So I gave it a name, which is a joke, following a hacker custom. You see, GNU is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Units. This is a custom which is a humorous way of giving credit when you write a program which is similar to some existing program. Back in the 70s, that was necessary very often 
because system level programs were not portable. So you'd see a nice program that ran on some other kind of computer, and you couldn't possibly run it on your computer, so you had to write another such program. Well, this was normal in the whole computing field. In our community, we had this humorous custom of recursive acronyms. Now, the reason why the word GNU is so funny is it's used for lots of wordplay, because the dictionary says the G is silent. The dictionary says it's pronounced new. So anytime you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. <clears throat> but when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you say the new system, you'll get people confused. You see, we've been... I announced it in September 1983 I started working on it in January 1984, that's about 25 years ago. And we've been using the system for 16 years. So it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU. So please pronounce it GNU. You must avoid pronouncing it new, and you should also avoid pronouncing it Linux. But in fact, a lot of people make that error. Most people think that the system is Linux, which is basically an error that got started in 1992 and has been spreading faster than we can correct it. I hope you will help. But here's what happened. During the 1980s, we had to develop component after component of the system. In 1990, we had almost everything but one major essential component was still missing. That's the kernel, which is the component that allocates the computer's resources to the other programs you run. So, the Free Software Foundation hired somebody in 1990 to write our kernel. And I chose a design I thought would enable us to finish it soon. But various things went wrong, and it took six years for us even to have a test release. And meanwhile, it still doesn't work well enough to recommend you use it. Well, that's a shame, but nobody succeeds every time. In any case, it was not a disaster because in 1991, somebody else wrote a kernel, a college student in Finland named Torvalds wrote a kernel, and he got it to work in less than a year. Of course, at the minimal level, but still it was working. That kernel is called Linux. And initially, it was not free software. Because when he released it at first, the license was too restrictive. It, for, it did not allow commercial distribution. Now, in order for a program to be free software, any kind of user, including a business, has to be able to have the four freedoms and be able to use them in all sorts of activities. If businesses are not allowed to redistribute the software, it's not free software. However, in 92, he changed the license of Linux and he adopted the GNU General Public License, which is the license that I had written to use in the components of the GNU system, most of them. <clears throat> so, because that's a free software license, at that time, Linux became free software. And the combination of the almost complete GNU system and the kernel Linux was a free operating system. For the first time, it was possible to buy a PC and run it in freedom. So the liberation of Linux in 1992 was a major contribution to the free software community. But at the same time, the people who put these two together, which were not us, because we still thought our kernel was going to be working soon, and it would be much better. So we didn't put the Linux together with the incomplete GNU system. Other people put them together. And they made a mistake. They thought, they started calling the whole system a Linux system, which means they paid all the attention to this one piece 
and ignore all the other pieces, big and small. Well, that's not fair to us, so please give us equal mention. That's all we ask for. If you call the system GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux, you will recognize the system's principal developer, the GNU project. We started almost a decade earlier, and we did a much larger piece of the job. So I think we deserve equal mention. But it's true that the issue of credit is not that important. It's not the most important ethical issue in life. There's something more important at stake here, and that is your freedom. Because when people think that the whole system is Linux, they think it exists mainly because of Mr. Toros. And they have a tendency to admire him tremendously and follow whatever he says. And what does he say? He doesn't agree that users deserve freedom. He rejects that idea. He has written articles rejecting the idea. He never agreed with this idea. Remember, when he first released Linux, he didn't make it free software. Later on, he made it free software, but not because he thought that was important. He, he, he had other reasons. He never has believed that users deserve freedom. So when people listen to him, he doesn't tell them that they should demand freedom. And if they follow his ideas, then they don't demand freedom, and maybe they lose it. Because freedom is frequently threatened, and if you don't defend your freedom, you will lose it. But in order to defend your freedom, you have to value your freedom. And in order to value your freedom, you have to have the concept of freedom. Well, in other areas of life, the debate about human rights has gone on for centuries, which has given us a chance to reach a lot of conclusions about human rights and spread these ideas around the world. That doesn't mean we always succeed in defending human rights. In fact, recent years, under the influence of the Bush regime, in many countries, human rights have been attacked and lost. But at least people understand the idea, and there are people trying to defend human rights. But computing is a new area of life. It's not very long that lots of people use computers. So there has not been much time to have a debate about what human rights a person deserves as the user of a program. Even if society were to try to have a debate, but mostly there hasn't been one. Because just about everybody who uses computers started with proprietary software, with no freedom. And everybody else they knew was using proprietary software. They thought that's the only way. So they took for granted that it's legitimate and ethical. And so they didn't have a debate about whether they deserve any freedom as software users. Instead, they let the proprietary software companies dictate the answer to the question, what human rights do I, as the user of a program, deserve? And they dictated none. Leaving so soon? They're walking out in mass. The program, you don't deserve any freedom. And most of society just accepted this. But we in the free software movement say it's wrong. We say that as the user of a program, you deserve certain human rights, namely the four freedoms that define free software. If there's one thing you remember from this speech, I hope, it, I hope you'll be able to recite the four freedoms. Freedom zero, freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one, freedom to study and change the source code so the program does what you wish. Freedom to, the freedom to help your neighbor. Freedom to distribute copy, exact copies when you wish. And freedom three, the freedom to contribute to your community. The freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So, we are challenging the 
decision that was dictated by the proprietary software companies and accepted by our, our not very democratic in practice governments, governments that have sold out to the mega corporations. But nowadays, in order to bring our ideas to the users of our software, we face two big obstacles. One is, they think the system is Linux. They don't notice that they're users of the GNU system. And the second is, they think that it's open source, and they don't know what free software means. It was in 1992 that the people who combined GNU and Linux made the mistake of calling the whole thing Linux, which they really shouldn't have done. So, nowadays, a lot of people use this version of the GNU system, and they think of themselves as Linux users. So when they see articles with the ideas of the GNU project, ideas I've told you today, they say, that has nothing to do with me because these ideas are free to do, and I'm a Linux user. So I would bother reading that. How ironic, if only they knew that the system they like is the, the GNU system, they might pay more attention when we tell them why we developed the GNU system for their freedom. And we might have a chance to convince them to start defending their freedom, and if they join us in defending freedom, our strength will be greater and our chances of winning will be greater. And this affects you. That's why you should call the system GNU slash Linux. If you're talking about the kernel alone, call it Linux. That's the name its developer gave it. That's fair. But when you're talking about the whole system, every time call it GNU slash Linux. And that way you'll help other people understand what really happened and why. But the other obstacle is, nowadays, Lots of people don't say free software or swept on free software. They call it open source. And why? That term was adopted by some people in the free software community back in 1998. Because those are the people who did not agree with us about freedom and they wanted to cause our ideas of freedom to be forgotten. So they thought as long as we say free, people who think of us are going to listen to the Free Software Foundation. So let's get rid of that word. So they invented another term which had never been used for this before. And that term is open source. So the big difference between free software and open source is in the philosophy. We present this, as you've seen, as a question of right and wrong, an ethical issue. Software developers have the moral duty to respect the freedom of the users and, u and users deserve freedom. P free software is ethical, proprietary software is unethical. The open source people, they don't just change the term, they change the ideas. They don't say anything like what we say. They never say that if software is not open source, that's wrong. To stop, to hush up that idea, is exactly their goal. So they only cite practical superficial values, like making powerful, reliable software. They studiously avoid saying open source is the only ethical way. And nowadays, since the corporations mostly prefer not to raise the ethical issue, they say, usually, open source. And so most people have heard open source, and they've heard the ideas that go with open source. And they imagine that we agree with those ideas. They take for granted we agree. They're shocked when they find out that the free software movement is about respecting users' freedom. Lots of people write to me and they say, I really love your contributions to open source. And I write back to them and saying, I have never intended to contribute anything to open source, and I don't ever expect I will, because I disagree with it. 
And they're surprised. They had no idea. So there are millions of people who think I've done something great and they assume I agree with open source and as a result, I, they, the free software movement is unable to reach them. So the open source people have essentially <coughs> built a wall in front of us hoping that no one will ever hear what we have to say again. So if you care about freedom, don't call it open source. I never describe my work that way. Never. I'm careful. Every time someone raises, a, asks me a question about open source, I respond by saying, what I do is free software and it's about freedom. Open source is something else. I'm not in favor of that. I don't intentionally contribute to that. So I will not describe my work by that term. I do this every time. I never let them wear me down into endorsing a philosophy which is not the one I really want to endorse. And that's what you have to do to defend freedom. You have to sometimes be persistent doing something that feels a little boring. Just be glad it's so easy. Other people had to risk their lives to defend freedom in other areas of life, and they still do. Because if we don't defend our freedom, we will lose it. And that has happened in our community also. For instance, in 1992, Linux was combined with GNU and there was a complete free operating system. By 1995, it wasn't always free. By that time, there were several competing distributions of GNU plus Linux. And most of the people maintaining these distributions did not really care about freedom. They were the sort of people who later would support open source. So one group of developers said, we can get an advantage for our distribution by putting in some non-free software. And then we can say to the users, choose our distribution and look at the bonus programs you get. And because most of the users had not heard the idea of freedom either, they responded to that and they said, yes, let's choose this distribution. So the, other, the developers of the other distributions looked at that and said, uh-oh, they have an advantage with those proprietary programs. We had better put in our proprietary programs in our distribution. So in this way, all the distributions put in proprietary programs justifying it by competing with the others. And by 2000, there was no free distribution in the world. So after my speeches, people would ask, where can I get a copy of this system? And I have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know any place I can recommend. Because all the distributions now contain proprietary programs. Would someone please develop a distribution which is all free software? So, nowadays I'm happy to say there are completely free distributions. There is, for instance, Ututo, spelled U-T-U-T-O. And there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG, Linux, and GNU, another recursive acronym. And there is GNUsense, which is written G -new Sense. But that's a joke also. You see, in my capacity as head of the GNU project, my job title is Chief GNUsense, spelled G-Nuisance. So, uh, GNUsense, the distribution, sounds the same way, but it's spelled differently. Anyway, these are not the distributions you usually hear about. So the well-known distributions still contain non-free software, which means that we have barely begun to recover the freedom that we lost, but only begun. We have a long way to go to get back to the stage where if you install GNU slash Linux, you're not installing non-free software. 
Some distributions of GNU slash Linux even come with an end-user license agreement for the non-free programs. So you've got to be careful. In GNU.org, you can find the list of free distributions. There are a few more. And you've got to be careful when you install programs on top of GNU slash Linux. They might be non-free also. If you look in directory.fsf.org, you can find the free software directory, which is a list of almost 6,000 useful free software packages. We have a staff person who adds more every day. <clears throat> but she has to check them carefully first. We don't just believe whatever people tell us. We check. <clears throat> and you've got to be careful when you buy hardware because there are some hardware devices that don't work with free software. And here's how that happened. You see, in the first few years, the only way a hardware device could work with the GNU slash Linux system at all was if somebody wrote a free driver for it. And that meant that there was strong pressure on all the users to develop free drivers and to demand that the manufacturers tell us the specifications so that we would know how to write free drivers. It's hard to write a program to do a job if you don't know what the job is. And there are companies that want to sell you a product and they won't tell you how to use it. The specs of the product are secret. Now this is ridiculous, it's outrageous, but they do it. And even more crazy is most people go along with it. Now, we have to maintain our own modified version of Linux, which we call Linux Libre, which is in which we have deleted these blobs. So it's free software. And the free versions, distributions of GNU slash Linux, they use Linux Libre as the kernel. So, it's easy to lose your freedom if you don't care about it. Our future depends, above all, on what we value. And the last topic I want to cover is free software and education. Schools must teach exclusively free software. That is their ethical responsibility. And there are four reasons for this. The most obvious is to save money. In any country, schools don't have enough money. They are limited by their budget. So they must not pay for permission to run proprietary software. Now, this is a very superficial reason. Even people who don't really know what free software means, and they may think that it means gratis software, but they still see this reason. However, some proprietary software companies eliminate this reason by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to the schools. And the reason is they are trying to use the schools to impose on all of society a, a permanent dependence on their products. Here's how it works. The school gets the gratis copies and then teaches the students to use them. So they develop a dependence, and then they graduate. And after they graduate, the company does not, or 